Now we come to the last unit for this course, Unit 7, which is entitled People and Ideas. The first item to cover in this unit is the vocabulary. The vocabulary is found on page 71, and the first exercise is exercise number 8. The vocabulary deals with idioms with the word hand. Of course, the word hand separately has a meaning, but if it is put with other words, they form what we call an idiom and they have a different meaning. In exercise number eight, we have several idioms that include the word hand. For example, like what you see in the box, in the box on page 71, we have different idioms such as a safe pair of hands, give me a hand, got my hands full, hand in hand, hands are tied, on hand, time on my hands, turn her hand to anything. Some of them are easy to guess and others need to be understood. If we go to sentence number one, it says, I have so much work to do at the moment. So this means what? This means that I'm busy. So the idiom that is to be used is to got my hands, to get my hands full or got my hands full. So to continue the sentence, we say, I have really got my hands full. Number two, it's amazing how multi-talented she is. So being multi-talented means that she can turn her hand to anything. Number three, you can trust him with any task. He is, he is what? He is a safe pair of hands. Number four, I'm bored. I've got nothing to do. I've got, I've got time on my hand. Number five, I'm sorry. I, I'd love to help you, but I'm afraid I'm not allowed to. Being not allowed to do something means my hands are tied. Number six, if you need anything, I'm just a phone call away. This means that I'm close to you. I am always on hand to help. Number seven, I'm really finding this problem very difficult to solve. Do you think you could give me a hand? This means that you need help. Number eight, mental illness can be a problem for very gifted people. Some people say that genius goes hand in hand with madness. This means that they accompany each other. Another vocabulary exercise is found on page 73. It's exercise number five. Exercise number five asks you to match the words in the box to their definitions. What are the words in the box? The word contemporary. Contemporary يعني معاصر. Crescent. Crescent يعني هلال. Humanitarian. Humanitarian يعني مهتم بالشؤون الإنسانية. Pilgrimage. Pilgrimage يعني حج. Reluctantly. Reluctantly يعني unwillingly. يعني بيعمل شيء يعني هو مش حبه. Renowned, renowned معناها well known or famous. If you come to the exercise, number one says, someone who lives or works at the same time as someone else. It means بشتعل في نفس الوقت. So this means contemporary. Number two, a curved shape that is wider in the middle and pointed at the ends. This is crescent. Number three, unwillingly means reluctantly. Number four, a person concerned with improving people's living conditions. This is the humanitarian. Number five, a trip to a holy place for a religious reason. This is pilgrimage. And finally, number six, famous and admired. This means renowned. Now we move to exercise number six, which asks you to complete the gaps in the sentences with the words in from the box above. So I'm going to use the same words like uh, contemporary, crescent, humanitarian, pilgrimage, reluctantly, or renowned. Number one says he was not ambitious and took the post reluctantly. 
Number two, the moon appeared as a dazzling yellow crescent. Number three, they hoped they would get the chance to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. Number four, Ali was my contemporary at university. We studied together at Oxford. Number five, she is renowned as a brilliant speaker. Number six, he was a humanitarian who was dedicated to preventing unfair treatment. Now we move to another section, which is grammar. It is on the same page, page 73. It discusses what we call quantifiers. A quantifier is used before a noun to indicate the amount or quantity of the noun. So we have quantifiers that describe or come before singular countable nouns. We have quantifiers that come before plural countable nouns, and we have quantifiers that come before uncountable nouns. So let's complete the table found in exercise number seven. I'd like you to use your books with me to have a look and complete. Under the singular and plural uh, and singular first countable nouns, we are going to write no, either, every. Under the plural countable nouns, we are going to write no, any, both, few, a few, a lot of, some, several, many, most, and all. Under uncountable nouns, we are going to write no, little, a little, a lot of, some, much, most, and all. These quantifiers are used, as we said, to specify the amount or quantity of the noun. So we have to notice whether the noun is countable or uncountable. If it is countable, we have also to notice whether it is in the singular or the plural form. Come to exercise number eight. It asks you to circle the correct answers. Sometimes you might have more than one correct choice. In number one, the correct choice is all because it comes before the word Muslims. Number two, the correct choice, actually we have two correct choices, many and a few, because we have the word adventures. So we can say many adventures and a few adventures, because like what we said, few and a few come before the, uh, the countable nouns. Number three, we have a space then of, of the, the expression of the here should be preceded by a word like non. So we choose letter E. We cannot say no of the, no, this is not correct. You can say nobody, no one, but as long as we're saying of the, we do not use no, we use non. Then we move to number four. We have Ibn Battuta is one of the most remarkable travelers of all time because the other choices are every, every comes before a singular countable noun, and little comes before the non-countable noun. Here, the word time is non-countable, and according to the meaning of the sentence, only all could be used. Number five, Ibn Battuta had not planned to spend space time. So here we're going to say much time or a lot of time, but we cannot say many time. Exercise number nine, we can cover item number three. For example, when it asks us to de determine what follows either, we say either or. What follows neither, we say neither nor. Remember, the difference between little and a little and few and a few. Okay, let's highlight this point. When I say little, this means that this is a very small amount that is not sufficient. When I say a little, it is a small amount, but it is sufficient. The same is done with few and a few that comes before a countable noun. When I say few, this means that also a small amount of so uh, something or a small number of something, but they are enough. But when I say only the word few, few means, you know, it is insufficient. So remember, when I say a, 
before few or little, this means a positive meaning, something which is sufficient. If I remove the a, it means that it is something which is insufficient. Exercise number 10, I'm going to give you the answers. Number one is all. Number two is few. Number three is every. Number four is many. Number five, some. Number six, either. Number seven, any. Number eight, a few. Number nine, all. Number 10, every. Number 11, all. Number 12, little. And number 13 is lot. Back to the vocabulary on page 75. Exercise number 5A, the irregular plurals. The plural is usually formed by adding an S or an ES to the word, the noun. But sometimes the plural form is put in a different way. Here it covers the words that end in ION, that form the plural by replacing the N with an A. For example, number one, criterion, singular, becomes criteria with an A. Phenomenon, singular, becomes phenomena. Instead of the N, we add an A. Three, four, and five tackle the fact that words that end in IS, when they are turned into the plural form, they take an ES instead of the IS. Like, for example, hypothesis becomes hypothese, analysis becomes analyses, and finally, in number five, thesis becomes theses. So instead of the ES, put an IS. These words are going to be used in exercise number five. They are put in sentences. Some of them are correct and others are incorrect. The correct ones are number three and four. One, two, and five need correction. Number one, as long as he says he wrote an excellent doctoral thesis, of course, this thesis should be changed into thesis. There is a strange phenomena with an A. It should be replaced with phenomenon because he says a ah, strange. Number three is correct because it says that this hypothesis, so this comes before a singular, you know, uh, noun. What are the criteria? Here it is correct because R and criteria are both plural. Number five, we are carrying out a detailed analysis. No, it should be detailed analysis because we have again the letter, the letter A. The letter A necessitates that you have to use a singular noun because A means one. Finally, we move to the last part of this a unit, again, we are back to the grammar. The grammar here is an easy part because it discusses the conditionals that we are accustomed to. The conditionals means using the if conditional, and we have four situations or four um, cases for the conditional. Zero conditional, first conditional, second conditional, and third conditional. Uh, exercise number seven asks you about which conditionals do we use to talk about. Number one, likely conditions, things which are very likely to happen. Very likely to happen, this takes the first conditional. For example, when I say, if I study, I will succeed. This is something definite and very probable to happen. Number two, unlikely conditions things which might happen, but probably not. This is the second conditional. When I say, for example, if I had money, this is a past tense, I would buy a car. If I had money, I would buy a car, means that the current in the current situation, I do not have the money and I do not have a car. In case I have the money, I will buy a car. So here, this is a situation that is not existing and is not likely to happen. But again, there is a probability, though it might be a weak one. This is, dif this is different from the third conditional highlighted in item number three, when he says impossible conditions. Impossible conditions are things which are unreal and did not happen. For example, like when I say, if I had studied harder, 
I would have succeeded. Had studied past participle, and the second part is would have plus the past participle. This is impossibility because I did not study, and uh, the result was that I did not succeed. Number four tackles the zero conditional. The zero conditional refers to general conditions, things which can occur at any time and often occur more than once in their results. Okay, um, so for example, when I say that, if the water boils, it evaporates. This is a very common phenomenon, so it does not need emphasis because this is a kind of a fact. For more explanation regarding the conditionals, kindly go to page 146. Exercise number 8a asks you to match the conditional clauses, sentences from 1 to H, and from 1 to 8, sorry, and uh, letters from A to H. We're going to match them. I'm going to give you the answer. Number one is H. If they had brought a map, they wouldn't be lost now. Number two, if you solve the problem, it's letter D. I'll buy everyone dinner. Number three, if I were you, this is letter E, I would listen to her very carefully. If I had my own car, this is letter F, I would go away every weekend. Number five, if I had worked harder, this is letter C, I could have gone to college. Number six, if you don't leave right now, it's letter A, I'll phone the police. Number seven, I'll phone the hospital, letter H, if you don't have time. Number eight, if the ball touches the line, letter B, it is in, not out. So if you see, the sentences according to their meaning are given or are put in the appropriate conditional form. Okay, dear students, I wish you all the best of luck. Hopefully, inshallah, you will find the units easy to understand. Thank you.